Hi, I'm Melanie Ann Phillips, co-creator of the Dramatic Theory of Story. And in this episode of Beyond Dramatica, I'm going to be talking about op quads. That stands for operations quads. And these operations are the forces or dynamics that twist and turn the Dramatica structural chart like a Rubik's Cube in order to wind up dramatic potential that unfolds over the course of the story. Now, as you may recall, this is the Dramatica structural chart and it's comprised of quads. You'll see that at the top there are four names, universe, physics, mind, and psychology. And those four items constitute a quad, or a family. Each one is subdivided into four smaller items, and each of those items is further subdivided and then subdivided again until you end up all the way down at the bottom in the very smallest elements of story structure. The top of the structure has the greatest structural impact on genre. The next level down has the greatest structural impact on plot. Down below, the greatest structural impact on theme, and finally, the structural building blocks or impact on character. Now, this is a mind at rest, the psychology of the story, as if it were a single human being. In fact, it's a map of our own psychology, each and every one of us, and the items in it, the semantic terms, are there to describe how the processes of our minds are like wheels within wheels, that one process is actually made up of a subfamily of smaller processes all the way down to the basic elemental processes or elements of the mind represented in the dramatic structural chart. When it's static like this, everything is balanced, everything is symmetrical, and there's no dramatic potential. In the human mind, this means that there is no motivation, there's no discontent. Everything is perfectly balanced. In other words, we're okay with our world, and our world is okay with us. But that seldom, if ever, occurs in real life, and it really doesn't have any purpose being in a story, because then there's no story to tell. Everything's fine. So, in real life, experiences tend to wind up this model, twist it and turn it, and put things out of alignment as we deal with experiences and situations that are not as we would desire them to be. And over a course of a period of time, it has wound up these wheels within wheels, small, starting at the smallest level at the bottom, until it winds up all the way to the top and locks in place. At that point, we have wound it up so tightly, we can't really see the forces that created that problem anymore. And it really isn't a problem. It's just a motivation. It just describes what's driving us but only when we find ourselves in a situation in which that initial response that we learned that wound up this way of dealing with things and set it in place, when that is no longer appropriate because the situation has changed or because we've moved to a new situation in which that no longer works well, then we have a problem because we're all locked into something we can't even see and it's not serving us well. And the only way we're ever going to resolve it is to unwind this thing and get back down to the bottom of it to ask ourselves, should we stick with this approach and treat the current situation as an exception? Or perhaps just if we hold out a little bit longer, things will improve and we'll win with our usual way of seeing things? Or do we have to reevaluate like the character Scrooge in A Christmas Carol and realize we're the ones who are really out of sync here? The situation's never going to change. And if we want things to be better, we have to go back down to the bottom, to our basic assumptions, and choose some other way of approaching the world. A new paradigm, a new worldview, a new manner of acting, a new attitude. Well, that's how stories exist in order to teach us this lesson. But you can't just immediately jump down there. Act by act, scene by scene, the opposing viewpoint that's being put forth through the obstacle character in a story puts pressure on the main character to strip away these justifications, these tight windings, act by act, scene by scene, as the story continues, until it becomes obvious that some basic assumption, some basic forgotten way of doing things, is now in conflict with the way things are. And then we have a choice, a leap of faith, to either keep on doing it the old way, or to take a chance on the new. The issue is, the old way has always served us before. That's why it became so tightly wound. But this time it seems to be failing and has not worked act by act and scene by scene 
Should we hold out, hoping it will eventually just butt its way through and make things work? Or should we change? But we've never tried the new explanation put forth by the obstacle character, or in our real lives, put forth by the alternative viewpoint that we are considering adopting, which is what the obstacle character represents. N instead of having a tried and true one, we have one that seems to explain more, but it's never been tried. It makes more sense, but it's never been tried. So what do we do? Jump ship on our original concepts? Or, s or instead stick with them and, and hope they work again in the nick of time. And that's why you really can't tell in a leap of faith what's the proper way to go. Well, this structure, like a Rubik's Cube, must twist and turn to illustrate how those tensions are wound up in the first place. And there's a direct correlation between what happens in the model and what happens in our own psychology. But before we talk about these operations and how they twist and turn, just a note that this model isn't just um, spaces to drop something in. Sort of like a periodic table of elements in physics, there's a meaning to location. Just like you have families of rare earths or the noble gases, so too you have families here called universe, physics, mind, psychology, but subfamilies, kind of a three-dimensional periodic table of story elements, as it were. Now, the structure itself is not just a bunch of lines. Each quad actually represents a function. That quad represents an iterative equation, the same kinds of things that create fractals. And the first picture I'll draw for you is just A, B, C, D. This translates to an equation that A divided by B equals C, D, meaning that we blend these two items, and you've seen there are a lot of semantic my items in the chart, together, we consider them together, like desire and ability would become desirability. We no longer see them as a single thing. We see this, is this desirable? Meaning, do we desire it and are we able to do it? Blend it together. Once we do that, we do that to have a baseline against which we can then measure A against B. We can see these other two items and say, how do they relate? Which one's better? in terms of our desirability. Well, another way of looking at things is that these different functions change as the process continues. And they change and iterate, starting at the bottom level and working their way through in spirals until they go through all the levels and move up to the next level and go through all those in the next level and then finally reach the top. Everything is involved by the time that happens and that represents a complete exploration of an issue by the mind. Well, these operation quads, or op quads, that flip and rotate that are in the following form. Some are flips and some are rotates. Flips in an op quad operation will exchange the position of these two, so A, B, C, D, might become A, B, D, C. Now what that means is that it before C was considered before D. Now mental function D is considered before C. So D gets preferential treatment. D becomes more important even though they're still both combined into D, C to look at which is better, A or B. A way of looking at it is, suppose there's an irritant in life, and it irritates your logic. Suppose C is the word logic, and there's actually a quad that does have logic in it. Your logic is not making any sense. This thing just doesn't make sense no matter what you do. Well, then you might ask yourself, well, if I can't make sense of it, how do I feel about it? And that would be down here, feeling. If that happens, you're essentially saying, I'm no longer going to use my logic I'm going to put that aside and move my feelings into position. And when I do that, I've now flipped those elements in the quad along this axis. i would flipped these two and said, this one is being irritated. My logic is not functional, like a, a, a pain that causes a scab. We're going to move it out of the way, and we're going to substitute something in its place that might be more functional and use that for a while. That changes the nature of this equation. It flips it to this form. What if this represented feelings? And you could say, okay, 
I don't like this. I don't like this at all. I don't like how long it's taking. I don't like where it's headed. Well, then you could substitute your logic. And when you do, then you say, well, I don't like what's going on. But if I just hold out another week, then something good is going to happen, I know, according to the way things are going. And so I just have to put my feelings aside and buck up and bear it because a week from now, things will be better. So forget about my feelings. Let's go with the logic. That's flipping things out of place. In other words, substituting one item of consideration, one mental process for another, is a flip. But that's only a flip in a spatial sense. It replaces their position, one position for another. But we can also flip and change in time. For example, suppose we had one, two, three, four was the order in which we dealt with these. This item first, then this second, then this third, and this fourth. Well, you can take that one, two, three, four, and you can rotate it 90 degrees to the right or 90 degrees to the left, and it will change then which of these items will go first. By moving it one way or the other, you change where the starting point is for your consideration. You're no longer changing how they relate because rotating it keeps them in the same alignment. It doesn't like flip them over, as it were, or flip them from side to side and change the way that they are actually positioned relative to one another. Instead, it just changes which one comes first but keeps them like a dial. They still have their relative position one to another. Rotates deal with things like, I don't like this process. I don't like that I always wake up in the morning and the first thing I have to do is shower and then get dressed and do this. You might end up later on deciding you're going to shower at the end of the day instead and wake up in the morning and begin the second part of the process that would normally have showering be first. Well, now showering has moved all the way around to last, and then when you go to the actual first thing you do, it's the thing you do after showering, which is get dressed, go to work. Maybe that's not a problem. Maybe the showering was a problem. So moving things out of sequence can solve problems for us too, just which one comes first, as it were, without changing the actual order. Well, these flips and rotates, they can flip this way or that way. And they can rotate this way or they can rotate that way, clockwise and counterclockwise. And that depends on your answers to dramatic questions. But before we go there, there's one more thing these quads, uh, operation quads, can do. The operations can also decide to carry the children or not. Now, it's an odd phrase. But suppose that you had this item here and this item here, and they were going to flip position. Well, underneath you see that they have children, we call them. The first level of four underneath this item, and then 16 little items under that level of four, because it's subdivided into four again. Well, when this changes position with that as a result of a psychological windup, does it carry all those children with to the other side or leave them behind and just flip at this level? And why is that? Because sometimes we flip just the major processes, but we leave the underlying processes in place so that we still use the same sub-evaluations in our wheels within wheels, but simply change to use them under feeling instead of under logic. Other times, we take the whole stack of considerations and move them back and forth. Now, this can be true during flips or during rotates. Do they take the children or do they not take the children? Now, this model represents two wind-ups. One winds up around the main character, which represents our sense of self. And the other one winds up around the objective or overall story, which represents our environment. Which one winds up first will tell which one's more screwed up and which one's more screwed in place and indicates which one is going to be easier to change. Finally, there's a fourth operation in the op quad, which is one that rearranges the operations themselves and puts them in different positions. Just like every quad, whatever's in the lower left-hand corner, or number four, one, two, three, four, whatever's down here is going to be part of a spiral that's working up to the next level. And it's going to seem a little out of place because it's gathered all of that tension of rising up in what appears to be a circle and put it all in here and it makes it look a little odd. So it always functions a little differently. So in op quads, the fourth kind of op quad actually changes the orientation of the op quads that are applied. We'll continue in part two.